Well, we are in the uh, book of Joshua, and this morning we're in chapter 6, and it's a lengthy chapter, <clears throat> so I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to read verses 6 through 21, and much of the rest of it I will read or make mention of, of course, in the lesson itself. But the first verse, first six verses speak, or the first five verses speak, uh, give the Lord's instruction to Joshua about how they were to proceed against Jericho, and that's very unusual military instructions. So with verse six on, he gives the instruction to the priests and the nation, and he, they carry it out in our text. So Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. Then he said to the people, Go forward and march around the city and let the armed men go before the Ark of the Lord. And it was so that when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward and blew the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark while they continued to blow the trumpets. But Joshua commanded the people, saying, you shall not shout, nor let your voice be heard, nor let a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I tell you, shout. Then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord taken around the city, circling it once. Then they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Now Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew the trumpets and the armed men went before them and the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while they continued to blow the trumpets. Thus the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did so for six days. Then on the seventh day, they rose early at the dawning of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day, they marched around the city seven times. At the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpet, trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city shall be under the ban. It and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who are in her, with her in the house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But as for you, only keep yourselves from the things under the ban so that you do not covet them and take some of the things under the ban and make the camp of Israel accursed and bring trouble on it. But all the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted, and the priests blew the trumpets. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and the walls fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took the city. They utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, it's a great privilege to be here on a Sunday morning. We're going through this pandemic and it's changed our schedule quite a bit and our lives have been altered by it, but we're able to come back under these conditions and, and meet, and it's a great thing to be with your people on the Lord's Day. 
see one another we haven't seen throughout the week and have fellowship. And this is great fellowship. This is fellowship. It's meeting together with one another, with people who are born again, people of a common mind, and meeting around the Word of God and studying it and reflecting upon it, worshiping you in song and worshiping you in our heart, worshiping you as we reflect upon the things that are in our text. And so, Lord, we pray you would bless us, bless us with an understanding of these things. Some things in this passage are difficult to understand and accept. Difficult, certainly, for the world, but even for Christians, they can prove difficult. But we pray that the Spirit of God would open our minds to them and help us to understand and help us to understand the great lesson of this text and learn this great lesson about your sovereignty and your empowerment. The things that took place so long ago in ancient history are just as relevant for us today. And the lesson in this passage is very relevant for us today. So may we learn that. Teach us, Lord. Give us great confidence in you and in your word that we would follow it we live according to it. So we ask your blessing upon us spiritually, but we also pray for our material needs. We do that whenever we pray together on a Sunday morning. But of course, in these past months, the urgency of praying for our physical needs is all the more important with this virus about. We pray that you would bless all of us and keep us safe. We pray for David Kaysen and his wife and family that you would keep them safe and give them recovery and health and pray for others, Lord, who are vulnerable to all of this. Madeline Hargrove and Betty Radford and Audrey Harrell and Margaret Smith. We pray that you would give special protection to them. But we pray for all of us that you would watch over us and give us wisdom and health. And then for those that are grieving, we pray for them. We think of Jonah Waldhart following Jim's passing and his entrance into glory. And what a great thing that is. And we know she's greatly encouraged by that, as others are. But nevertheless, at times of grief come, and I pray that you would encourage and strengthen her. Lord, we thank you for the great blessing that you have given to every one of your children, all of your elect, all of those that you have chosen from the foundation of the world, but you have brought to yourself through saving grace and faith. And we thank you for the future that's ours. We live in troubled times, but we have a glorious future. And we thank you for that. And thank you that as we live in this world, you are leading us. We're reminded of that in this text, and we're to follow you. And as we do that, every step is a safe step. So Lord, bless us now as we sing our next hymn, prepare our hearts for our time of study together. We thank you for this great opportunity we have to be together, to read the text of Scripture, to consider the meaning, and pray that through that you build us up in the faith. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> when we think of man's genius, we think of art, literature, certainly we think of science, but we also see it in war. Man has a genius of inventing weapons of destruction for new situations. It's always been that way. In the British Museum, there are great alabaster slabs taken from Assyrian King Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh. And on them is depicted the Battle of Lachish. That battle is referred to in the Bible. Lachish was a large walled city southwest of Jerusalem. At some point, villages realized that one way to stop these invading armies is to build walls. And so they built walls. And here we see on these bas reliefs 
All the different engines of war, the inventions of siege warfare designed to breach the walls of those cities. There are arches, archers on ladders against the walls, shooting arrows at defenders above. Great siege towers rolled up to the wall, often with battering rams, all kinds of weapons to overcome walls of defense. What isn't found in any of those scenes of battle is trumpets and priests. What we find in Joshua 6 at the Battle of Jericho when priests blew ram's horns and the walls collapsed. It was a unique battle that relied on the power of God, not the genius of man. And that's the point. It was to demonstrate to Israel at the very beginning of their conquest of Canaan that the Lord is great and he can be trusted. But ultimately, it occurred for us, the church, to teach us how we fight the battles that we face every day. Paul wrote of it in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-5. through 5. We live in the flesh, but don't war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare, he wrote, are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. That's the lesson of Joshua 6 for us. We walk and war by faith. We fight an invisible enemy and cause the collapse of unseen castles. But they're just as real as Jericho and its tall brick walls. Joshua had been scouting Jericho and making his plans for battle when he had a supernatural encounter. A warrior stood before him with sword in hand. He was the captain of the Lord's army. When Joshua heard that, he fell on his face and he worshipped him. The warrior received his worship and told him that the ground that he was on was holy. What all of that indicated is that this was no man but a divine being. It was a, a theophany, an appearance of God, appearance of the Lord, what we would call a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. And that is made explicit in verse 2 of chapter 6, where the conversation continues and the captain is identified as the Lord. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and the valiant warriors. Verse 1 is a, a parenthesis that gives context. Jericho is described as tightly shut up. Uh, no one went out and no one came in. The point is the city was paralyzed with fear. They didn't go out to fight. They stayed within the security of those great walls. But it also indicated the difficulty of Israel's mission in, in conquering it. Its gates were shut tight. Its walls were tall. There was no way in, it would seem, except by means of a bitter fight. But the difficulty, like the, the flooded Jordan River earlier, only magnified the might of the Lord. If, if Joshua had been developing a strategy for taking Jericho by conventional means with with ladders or building a siege ramp, it was scrapped when the Lord said, I've given it to you. It was the Lord's assurance that victory was so certain that it was as though it had already occurred. I've given it to you. It was now only a matter of Joshua following the orders of his captain. Well, the orders are given in verses 3 through 5, and they would have been received by any military man with uh, surprise, to say the least. Verse 3, you shall march around the city 
all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. Also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up every man straight ahead. Now that has to be unique in the, animal, in the annals of military history. But it was a strategy with at least two purposes. First, to test the people's faith in the Lord and their obedience to His Word. That was the, the previous generation's problem, the previous generation's failure. The great walled cities of Canaan were too big a challenge for them. They couldn't trust God to topple them. Now the Lord put the new generation to the test. Will you walk around the city walls and trust me to pull them down? Well, that's the first pur purpose. The second person was to magnify the greatness of God. This was not a victory that could be claimed by Israel's soldiers or attributed to the genius of Joshua as though he were an, an ancient uh, Napoleon or Patton. This was supernatural. So that when the conquest was complete, all Israel would have to say, to God alone be the glory. He's all sufficient. And it would show the, the nature of all of Israel's victories in Canaan. The, the strategies may differ. In fact, we will see that at the next battle at Ai. The battle is different. The strategy is different. But the reason for victory is always the same. And that is the captain of the Lord of hosts was going before Israel. The plan was also symbolical. You'll notice all the sevens, seven priests, seven trumpets, seven days of circling the city, seven times around the city on the seventh day. The word seven occurs four times in verse four and 14 times in the chapter. And clearly, we're intended to notice that. Notice it for a purpose. Seven is the number of perfection. It's the number of completion. And the, the meaning was to reinforce that idea that God's plan is complete. God's plan is perfect. And, and the Lord gave Israel a complete victory. It always is complete when God gives us instruction. There is nothing incomplete in God's plan. It may be very simple, and it may be puzzling to us because of its simplicity, but it's always complete and always per perfect. His ways and His works are that, and we can rest in them. But, it's a test. Obedience always is a test. It can be counterintuitive. Often it is. Do we go forward as God has instructed us to do? Uh, now that applies broadly from our personal lives to businesses and how they are um, run and uh, to our church and how it is governed and it's run. It applies across the board to all things. Are we going to follow the Word of God or are we going to follow the way of the world? Oftentimes, worldly wisdom gives us a shortcut. It, it seems to ha have a quick fix and have the, the clear insight at how we should do things. Well, this is the simplest way to do it. While following Scripture means we have to wait on the Lord. And waiting is always difficult. It's a test. But that's the life of faith. 
Certainly Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, where Paul said, do not be conformed to this world. Literally, do not be conformed to this age, to its way of thinking, its way of doing. Those who walk by faith walk with the Lord and think differently. But he always honors his word and he honors those who are faithful to him. Always. Joshua didn't question the Lord's strategy or hesitate to make preparations for it. He had learned the lessons of the previous generation. He'd seen their failure. He'd seen the consequences. He'd learned the lessons of 40 years in the wilderness. So he went to the priests and in verses 5, or rather 6 and 7, gave them the instruction to carry the Ark of the Covenant and march around the city blowing ram's horns told the people that an armed guard was to accompany the seven priests and go in front of the ark and go behind it. The ark was the focus. It symbolized that the Lord was in their midst, that He was there, that the battle was His. The only sound that would be heard was that sound of the trumpets. People, the people were to remain silent and wait for Joshua to give the order. And only then, upon the orders of Joshua, would they shout. So according to verse 11, Joshua had, <clears throat> had the ark of the Lord taken around the city, circling it once. Then they came to the camp and spent the night in the camp. The second day... Joshua rose early in the morning. The priests took up the ark of the Lord and the people marched around the city again. The city of Jericho occupied about nine acres. You don't need to assume that every Israelite took part in the march. It had seven priests and very likely had representatives from each of the tribes would have been a large company of people even at that. And so the march around the city would have taken something like 25 to 35 minutes. Every day, the Canaanites would see a long column of soldiers and priests coming across the plain and circle their city in a kind of eerie silence, broken only by the sound of the horns. Verse 14 says that, they did it for six days. And it must have produced a growing sense of apprehension inside the city of the approaching doom. During the first crusade, when the French crusaders came up to conquer Jerusalem, they marched around the city singing psalms. And on the walls of the city, the Muslims held crosses that they'd taken from the churches, and they mocked the cross, and they defiled the cross. Well, there's no account of that kind of bravado from the walls of Jericho. They were evidently paralyzed with fear, wondering what the, the strange procession meant each day. Then came the seventh day. Verse 15 states, the people rose early, at the dawning of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only that day they marched around the city seven times. At the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city shall be under the ban. It and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who are with her in the house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. Everyone else, though, men, women, and children, were to be put to the sword. That's the idea in the phrase, put under the ban. Uh, the Hebrew word translated ban is the word harem, and it means devoted so it, it can be translated, the city shall be a devoted thing. 
devoted to a specific end or purpose. Since Jericho was the first city of the conquest within Canaan, it was devoted to the Lord as the first fruits of the land and offering to Him. Verses 18 and 19 state that all of the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron belonged to the Lord and they were to be put into His treasury. In the other cities, the, the rest of the conquest, all of the spoils of war went to the people. But Jericho was different. Jericho is the first city of conquest, and so nothing in that city was to be taken. It was the Lord's, and it was to be devoted to His service. But the people of Canaan were devoted to destruction. And so under the ban also means being utterly destroyed. That's what happened. After Joshua shouted, verses 20 and 21 state that the people shouted, and the priests blew the trumpets, and the, wall, the walls fell down flat. Now how did that happen? Is there a naturalistic, rationalistic explanation for this, such as an earthquake occurring just at the right time? Well, if so, it would have been in just the right way, not only in just the right time, because the whole walls, uh, the, all the walls of the city fell down except where Rahab's house was, which indicates that this is something completely of the Lord, if that's not clear enough in and of itself. Now, people who doubt miracles and would dismiss this as just a kind of myth, a myth that's been passed down, a fable that has been enhanced. And maybe they did conquer a city and did conquer Jericho like other armies had done, but this, this couldn't have happened. Well, people who doubt that uh, and ha have a problem with the, the account have a problem, not, not with reason, but with faith. There's nothing unreasonable about God doing this. Not if you believe in the God of the Bible, which is not an unreasonable thing to believe. Not if the, the God of the Bible can create everything out of nothing, can breathe life into dust and create a living human being. There's nothing God cannot do. In fact, that's what he said to Abraham when he gave him the promise that out of his his old age, when he was past the age of bearing children and, and Sarah herself was barren, that he'd have a child. And Abraham marveled over that, found it, and was a bit incredulous, I guess. And God says, anything too difficult for the Lord? Which can also be translated, anything too wonderful for the Lord? There's nothing he can't do. There's no wonder he can't perform. And so this is nothing. Jesus is described in Colossians 1.17 as holding everything together in the universe by the will of His power. We can just let the atoms go and the walls fall. Well, that's how the Bible explains it. And this has happened. It's not, it's not a problem of reason, it's a problem of faith. And in Hebrews 11 verse 30 says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down. This was a miracle which God brought about in response to the people's faith and obedience. Just as crossing the Jordan, you remember, the priests come to the Jordan, it's flooding. They don't stop. They don't stand before this flood and think, what are we going to do now? They just kept going, and as the sole of their foot touched the water, the water's backed up. That's the life of faith. Going forward, and when it seems like this is not the wise thing to do. God works. That's what He did here. The walls fell, the people attacked. And verse 21 states, they utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. Everything but Rahab and her family. Joshua kept the promise that the two spies made to her and sent them into her house to bring her and her family and things out. 
They brought them out, we're told, and placed them outside the camp of Israel. Why outside the camp of Israel? Because they weren't ready for the camp of Israel. They were Gentiles and Canaanites, and they, needed, in need of, they were in need of ceremonial cleansing before they became a part of the nation. Then verses 24 and 26 state that the city was burned with fire and cursed by Joshua. The chapter ends, verse 27, So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. It was a decisive victory and a token that the Lord had given all of Canaan to Israel as he had promised to Abraham. It was their inheritance. But they got it at the cost of a lot of Canaanites. What about them? One commentator wrote, the annihilation of the Canaanites is one of the most perplexing moral problems in the Bible. And a lot of critics would agree with that. But all of this has to be looked at in context. This was divine judgment on the Canaanites who were not innocent people. Their fate had been foretold centuries earlier in Genesis 15, verse 16. God had promised all of the land of Canaan to Abraham and his descendants forever in Genesis 13, verse 15. And again in Genesis 15, verse 7. He is the Lord of all the earth. He is the Lord of all the universe, but certainly the Lord of all the earth, and it's His land to give to whom He wishes. But in Genesis 15, verse 16, he told Abraham the people would not inherit Canaan for over 400 years, not until the iniquity of the Amorite was complete. Now that would take four generations. We get an idea of the iniquity that is referred to there from the book of Deuteronomy. In chapter 18, there's a list of what is called their detestable things. And the list includes witchcraft, idolatry, child sacrifice. This was a murderous, immoral people. Their perversion was full-blown. This was justice. Just what occurred with Sodom and Gomorrah. God is patient with sinners. He was patient with the Amorites and the Canaanites for four generations. But eventually, a holy God must execute justice. And justice had come. But this was also not only to carry out divine justice, the justice of a holy God against a very, very unholy people, this was also a, safe, a safeguard for the nation to protect Israel from what Dr. Bruce Walkey called the spiritual contagion of the Canaanites. Now that's the reason given in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 18, where Moses said they had to be eliminated, these Canaanites, so that they may not teach you to do according to all their detestable things. And the susceptibility of Israel to that spiritual disease is seen all through the Old Testament. So for the spiritual health and preservation of the nation and the purpose of God in salvation, the Canaanites had to be removed. It was only just. But also, this was a, a very specific remedy for a specific problem. It was not the general practice of war in Israel. It was restricted to the Canaanites and it was not used against other people. In the midst of this severe but righteous display of divine justice is also divine mercy and grace. Because verse 25 states, however, Rahab the harlot and her father's household, and all she had Joshua spared, 
and she has lived in the midst of Israel to this day. For she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. She learned the truth about the Lord, and she believed. She repented. Jericho didn't. And grace abounded to her. The harlot not only became a citizen of Israel, but she became an ancestor of the Messiah. Rahab is listed in Christ's genealogy in Matthew chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. That's grace. That's transforming grace. None of this is to soften the seriousness of what happened at Jericho and the ban on the Canaanites. Utterly destroy them. That's very serious. But again, it was restricted to the Canaanites and was not used against other people. And it certainly is not anywhere in the Bible set forth as a practice of the church. I mentioned the, mentioned the Crusaders earlier. When they stormed Jerusalem, they lacked all restraint. They'd been provoked somewhat by those in the city and those on the wall, but they entered the city and lacked all restraint, and as a result, they carried out a massacre. It's, because, it's been called one of the greatest crimes of history. They killed everyone in their path, soldiers and civilians, thousands of people. And then they all went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and celebrated Mass. Well, they called themselves soldiers of Christ, but they were not doing the Lord's work. God has given the sword to the state. The sword of the church is spiritual. It's the Word of God. It's Scripture, the Gospel. And we use it, as Paul told the Corinthians, for the destruction of fortresses. Those are our philosophical, spiritual fortresses that men, men have built in defense of error and in opposition to the truth. They are the worldviews of the age. That's our Jericho. And that's how Paul explains it in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So these are fortresses of the mind and will, intellectual strongholds. The battle is between truth and error, between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world. It's been that way from the very beginning. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, that men suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They know the truth, they see the truth, but they suppress it. They rationalize it away so that they can live as they please. Science is good. Christians do not object to science. Science is good, but men falsely use science and, contra and construct philosophy to dismiss the gospel and word of God as foolish and rest confidently in their own conclusions. These are the intellectual castles they inhabit, the walls they hide behind. Christian warfare is aimed at casting them down, while unbelievers aim at fortifying them against the light of the gospel. We won't succeed against them on their ground, fighting with their strategies and weapons. We can do that. We can succeed against them only by God's way and His means. That's the lesson of Jericho. It wasn't conquered by conventional warfare. Israel's tactics would have seemed foolish to any military genius by marching and shouting, though the walls fell. The gospel is like that. We don't need to shout, just speak. It may seem foolish to the world, it will seem foolish to the world, but it brings down the walls and the intellectual towers of men by God's power, not man's ability. That's the power of divine revelation over human reason. 
The gospel, Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So we don't need to try to engage the unbeliever on his ground. Paul never did that. In fact, when he came to Greece and to Corinth, he told them in his first letter that he didn't come as a philosopher. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 and 2. He didn't come to them with superiority of speech or of wisdom. In other words, I didn't come using all of the philosophical terminology that would impress someone. I didn't come to make people think I was educated in the Lyceum, that I was a, a, a person who studied under the, the students of Aristotle or Plato. He determined, he said, to know nothing among them, know nothing about that, about philosophy and the way of the world and the terminology of the world. He didn't come as a philosopher. He said he came not with superiority of speech or wisdom, determined to know nothing among them except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that was enough. Faith is not established in the unbeliever on the basis of argument and reason. Not that we don't have sound reasons for believing. We do. But it's established by God through the new birth through regeneration. It, it, it's not that we don't give reasonable responses to challenges raised against the truth. We do. We should. In fact, Peter said that we are to be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks about the hope that is in us. They should see there's a hope in us. And we should be able to defend that hope. And we're to do it the right way. He tells us the right way in 1 Peter 3, verse 15, with gentleness and reverence. But in chapter 1, verse 23, Peter said that we are born again through seed that is imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring Word of God. In other words, it is through the gospel that the Holy Spirit implants life in the heart of a person, in the, the, the hearer of the gospel, as he or she hears it, that seed is planted within them so that through the giving of the gospel, a person is born again and believes. Now, that's what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. It's not our skill in debate it's the Holy Spirit using the Word of God. It is supernatural, like Joshua chapter 6. The, so the soldiers shouted, the walls of Jericho fell. We preach or teach or tell the gospel and fortresses of the mind fall. We have the powerful and sharp two-edged sword that is the Word of God. With it, Paul says, we not only pull down towers of resistance, we take prisoners. And the prisoners or the captives are the thoughts of a person's mind. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, which means through the gospel, a person's mind is actually set free to think correctly, freed from error. The truth shall set you free. We struggle still. We know that. that even when an unbeliever is born again and his thoughts are taken captive by Christ, some resistance remains. So we have that and we'll have that till the day we die. We're tempted by the world. We're tempted by its ideas. So the battle continues within us and we must struggle to continually, daily, take every thought captive to Christ to, to align our thinking with God's revelation. And that takes time. That takes study. That takes prayer. That takes discipline. Christians need to discipline their life to study and consider deeply and obey the Word of God. That is the daily battle. Daily battle. When Israel obeyed, 
When they followed the Lord's instruction, he was with them. Walls fell and they triumphed. And it's the same for us. We must listen to his word and obey it. In connection with that, there is an epilogue to Joshua 6 that's instructive. Joshua cursed the city of Jericho in verse 26. It was never to be rebuilt. If it were, it would be rebuilt at great loss. Cursed before the Lord is the man who raises up and builds this city, Jericho. With the loss of his firstborn, he shall lay its foundation. And with the loss of his youngest son, he shall set up its gates. Centuries later, that very thing happened. It's recorded in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 34. In his days, Hiel... The Bethelite built Jericho. He laid its foundation with the loss of Abiram, his first son, and set up its gates with the loss of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. That's paganism. That's what Israel destroyed at Jericho. But it shows how contagious sin is and the results of unbelief, of ignoring God's Word, the destruction of family and self. Centuries had passed, but God's Word was still active and still relevant as it is today. John 3 verse 36 is 2,000 years old. But applies today, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And we have a picture of the wrath of God in Joshua chapter 6. If you've not believed in Christ for forgiveness and salvation, you're like those people in Jericho, doomed. It was a city of destruction. That's what the world today is. It is doomed. Don't be a fool like Hyle, who ignored God's word. Flee the wrath. Be like Rahab. Come to Christ as you are with all your sin. Come to Him. He'll remove it. Take it away. Take your guilt away, your sins away, as far as the east is from the west. Trust in Him, in His sacrifice, and be saved. May God help you to do that and help all of us to be men and women, young and old, like Joshua and that army following the Lord in all that He tells us to do. Let's close in a word of prayer and give thanks for the elements that we are about to take. Let's pray. I know you've enjoyed since the resumption of our Ministry of the Word services. It seems a long time now, back in March, April. can't remember exactly when, when we resumed these meetings and then you uh, appeared in person. But... I know you've enjoyed our weekly observances of the Lord's Supper. We've had to make adjustments to our regular uh, practices and in, in attempts to comply with uh, the precautions that uh, people are practicing these days. That's been at times a moving target. And it's also involved uh, changes to our schedule of meetings. And one of the a animating desires of the men who God used to form this church at the beginning was to imitate as closely as possible the early apostolic church practices as found in the New Testament. And one of those was the obvious uh, weekly observance of the Lord's Supper in the context of an open meeting of the church where uh, the teaching gifts that God had given the church uh, could be expressed. 
And so we've been holding to that practice, or the church has for the last almost 60 years, uh, meeting every Sunday evening uh, at 6.30, I think, for most of those years uh, to pursue the New Testament model of the church. And we intend to continue uh, to do that. As soon as things begin to approach normal, I uh, don't know when that will be, but when we're convinced that the evening meeting will be readily available to all, or at least most, of those who want to attend that meeting. So uh, as we look again this morning <clears throat> together around the Lord's table and remember him in the manner he left for us, we just wanted to communicate that uh, to all of you and to you who are listening uh, on the live stream, like a lot of things these days, uh, some of what we're doing, we're doing on a temporary basis. Uh, this is one of them until we can resume our normal uh, practice. A reading of the New Testament, especially the book of Acts and Paul's epistles, reveals that it was the normal practice of the early church as led by the apostles. In Acts 20, for example, uh, Luke makes reference to their visit to Troas, where on the first day of the week, he said, and that would be our Sunday, uh, we were gathered together to break bread. Luke wasn't saying we got together to have a meal. He said on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread, just as we're doing today. And Paul devoted almost an entire chapter of 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, uh, to uh, how the meeting of the church was be, to be conducted, especially in the context of the observance of the Lord's Supper. And it, it, uh, no, no uh, extra sermon today, so I'll just leave it at that, except to now read a portion of that familiar 1 Corinthians passage as a preparation for our, our observance this morning. If you're here and you know the Lord Jesus Christ and you have been the recipient of of the saving grace in the gospel, as we just heard from Dan this morning, then we want to invite you to participate with us in the supper. Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord, but a man must examine himself, and in so to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so with those instructions, uh, let me give thanks for the bread. Father, we are so grateful to you, uh, this beautiful picture that we have looked upon this morning in history, where you acted in such a powerful way uh, to see and hear from uh, Dan in his message, uh, how it illustrates the power of your saving work in our own lives and uh, how it represents <clears throat> uh, the sacrifice that was involved. It came not without cost, but you sent your very own son. And as we take this bread now, we remember him uh, with thankful hearts that he did not uh, consider it loss, but he took upon himself our sin so that he might gain our salvation. In his name we pray. Amen. I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, meaning in your unregenerate state, he made you alive together with him having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. 
Now, those two verses, particularly in verse 14, Paul states the, the means of God's forgiveness of the guilty sinner and the extent of it, which is complete. The image of a, a certificate nailed to the cross may have been borrowed from the accusation against Jesus, King of the Jews, that was nailed to the cross. But this certificate that Christ canceled out and was hostile against us listed the accusations of the law of Moses against the Jews and the accusations of the inner voice of conscience against the Gentiles. It's been likened to a blank, to a black slate filled with uh, our debts to God written in white chalk revealing a mountain of bankruptcy beyond anything that we could pay off. And then in a, a single, his single solitary death, Christ paid off all our debts. In one stroke, he erased everything written against us so that all the accusations have disappeared into dust, never to be read again. But he hasn't left us a blank slate. In place of the accusations of sin, it now reads the righteousness of Christ. We've been given a new start and a new life, fully and forever accepted by God. And it is, it is only as we understand what He did for us, the great debt Christ paid for us, that we, we will be able to live as we ought to live. Not simply in obedience, but living in obedience from gratitude and thanksgiving for what He did. Living in obedience because we want to, because we love Him. That's why we need to reflect upon His death by taking these elements weekly to remind us of what He did, to remind us of what we are by virtue of His grace. So let's give thanks for the cup that speaks of the sacrifice that forever removed our sins and guilt. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for what this cup represents. This wine speaks of the blood he shed for us. He was innocent, but our guilt was imputed to him. He bore it in our place, and the punishment in our place, but in doing so has cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea, never to be seen or heard from again. We thank you for that. Thank you for him and his death for us. Help us to reflect on this. Help us to be influenced by this and change. Sanctify us, Lord, as we consider him and his death for us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's close with a benediction. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that Christ will hold us fast. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.